us today, everyone. It's our hope that you leave today more informed and motivated to celebrate the resilience that lives inside of you. Today's event will be recorded. I will be leading a conversation with Brenda, followed by a question and answer period. But if you have any questions at any time during the event, please put them in the chat and Brenda will answer those towards the end of the program. You will also have the opportunity to ask Brenda a question directly if you so choose. Today's event could possibly be a bit triggering to folks, so please do what you need to do to keep yourself safe. If you need support or someone to talk to following today's conversation, we have members of our trauma therapy team available to talk to you after the event. You can reach them by dialing our office number, which is 312-443-9603. I believe that number will also be put in the chat if you need it. Okay, I'm pleased to introduce Brenda Tracy. Brenda is a nurse, mother, activist, and survivor. In 1998, she reported to police that she was brutally raped by four men two of whom played football at Oregon State University. In 2014, Tracy found the courage to come forward publicly with her story and now seeks to make the world a better place for survivors. She has worked closely with Oregon legislators to expand victims' rights and has successfully helped pass seven laws um, over three sessions including extending the Oregon statute of limitations to prosecute rape and mandatory testing of all rape kits in Oregon. Brenda has won numerous awards and was named ESPN's 2016 Top 25 Women. She has served on the NCAA Commission to Combat Sexual Violence and is a frequent guest commentator on ESPN. Tracy is the founder of the national nonprofit and campaign Set the Expectation, and she travels the country speaking to university students, athletes, and various organizations. Brenda, welcome to Resilience. We're so thankful to have you with us today. While I gave the audience a brief overview, I'd like to start today's conversation by asking you to tell us a little bit about yourself and your story. Okay, um, thank you so much for having me. Um, can I get a thumbs up? Can you hear me okay, Erin? Everybody? Okay, good. I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, <clears throat> oh, I'm, well, I'm frozen on my side. We hear you. Okay, okay, good. Oh, no. Uh-oh, something's, uh -oh, something's wrong. Okay, hold on. We don't see you, but we do hear you. Um... I might have to switch my camera. Yeah, I have to switch my camera. Sorry, hold on. Let me let me get this fixed. Just one second. <laughs> um, Anything happens in uh, in the virtual world these days. I know. I'm sorry. I quite I, have right. a cam I have a camera, and it reason it started doing wonky things yesterday, and so everybody can hear me, see me now. Okay, one more thumbs up. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. Um, no problem. Yes. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Brenda. Um, I am super happy to be here. Anytime I get the opportunity to um, speak with people who are on the ground doing the work, um, survivors, that's always like a really wonderful place for me to be because you'll hear as I give you a little bit of background on me that I mostly work in in spaces with men um, and men in athletics, um, which is a very can be a very different space than <laughs> what today is. Um, so thank you for having me. Um, so yes, I am a gang rape survivor. Um, I'm, I'm actually a childhood survivor of sexual assault. Also, um, I've, I've experienced several major traumas in my life. Um, but in the media, I am known for having survived a gang rape by college football players. Um, I think th just a little background on that so that you can kind of understand what it means for me to be where I am today. Um, at the time in 1998, I was a young woman. I was in my early 20s. I already had my two sons. I had my first son actually when I was 18. I was in high school, um, a senior. Um, but that uh, 
that assault happened and then I did everything that, you know, a good victim is supposed to do. I, I went and I got a rape kit done right away. Um, I went to the police, I reported. I um, thought that I did what I was supposed to do. I was reporting a crime and all four men were arrested the very next day. And so I thought the, I thought the wheels of justice were gonna work the way that they're supposed to. I thought that when people commit crimes that, you know, it's like a law and order episode. Like the bad guy gets arrested, I go to court, they go to jail, and then I just move on with my life. I had actually at that time in 1998 had never seen or known that I that I knew of a rape survivor or seen someone move through the process. So I didn't know what to expect. Um, I thought that the justice system worked a certain way. Um, but what happened was a very swift uh, backlash. Two of the men went to Oregon State University. So immediately it was a media story. And thank God we didn't have social media back then, but you know, it was on the front page of the newspaper. It was on the radio. It was the headline of the new, the local news. Um, I was Jane Doe, but people in my community knew that it was me. Um, and, the, and the conversation was, what about them? It wasn't about me. It was about what about them and, and who is she? The conversation about me was who is she? Why is she lying? Why is she trying to ruin these young men's careers? What's in it for her? What about her past? What was she wearing? Why was she drinking? You know, all of these things. And I really did not understand that because I was the victim of a crime, but yet now I'm a perpetrator because I, I'm being treated like the perpetrator because I was trying to ruin someone else's life. So this was hard for me. I was also um, receiving death threats against myself and my children, um, friends and people turned on me. Um, so it was, it was very, very difficult. I, I pretty much had, you know, my, my young, very young toddler age children and my parents that were pretty much on team Brenda. So, um, and I was, I was suicidal, um, at the time. So what I did do is, um, I, the DA, the DA, um, I wanted to prosecute. So in, I guess what I'm trying to say is in spite of all of this backlash, I still wanted to prosecute the men that hurt me. And so, um, I, I tried to pursue that, but the DA at the time told me I didn't have a good case. The DA said that um, it would be a he said, she said situation. I would have to go through four separate trials that could take years. Um, and then also that my rape kit would be made public. So all the photos of my body, which you know are, if, if you know anything about a rape kit, it's inside and outside your body is like made public. And so the DA said, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, well, no, like if I can't win, then what is the point of putting me through this? And like, I'm already receiving death threats. I, I don't even feel safe. Um, so I decided not to cooperate with the DA. And I did that based on the information that I was given. Um, I was making an informed decision in that moment. Um, but what happened was it went out in the media then that the case was, the charges were being dropped. And the other misconception is that people think I dropped the charges. I have no power to drop charges. The state dropped the charges. I have the power whether I, you know, participate in the process or not. So then the conversation was when that news came out, then it was, we'll see, we told you she's a liar because if something really happened, charges would be brought against these men. Again, I'm Jane Doe. I don't have a voice. I don't want more people to know that it's me. So I really have no recourse. I, I can't. Um, or people will know that it's me. So um, what I did do is I went to the school and I reported. Um, a common misconception about my story was that I was a, a student at Oregon State and I was not a student there. I was dating a football player. It was his teammates that raped me. Um, so I uh, went to the school. I found the sexual assault counselor. At that time, I didn't know anything about, I didn't even know if there was a title. There, I'm sure there wasn't a Title IX office at the time. But I found the person who, who deals with survivors and told her my story. And she said that they took it very seriously and that they would take care of it in-house. And so I trusted her and I believed her and I thought that that would be what would happen. And so I left that day feeling like, okay, well, I did what I could. And I always make a point when I talk to people, any group of people to say that, you know, I went there because I just wanted to make sure it didn't happen to someone else. There was no action I could take. I wasn't a student there. So it wasn't like I could start a, a process or anything. But I think it's important for people to understand that survivors don't always want to go through a process. We might not want to go to the police. We might not want to go through Title IX. We might not want to do anything, but just make sure that someone else knows this happened to me so that it doesn't happen to someone else. And that was, that was the only reason I had 
to, to go there and to do that. Um, so after that happened, I, I thought, well, now I'll just move on with my life. I'll, I'll try to recover from this. I'll take care of my children. Um, but another media story was going to come out and this was from the football team and my, uh, the rape happened right before the football season started. And so at the time, the head football coach at the time, he was asked by the media, Hey, what about your players being arrested? The charges being dropped. They spent a night in the jail and all that which everybody felt really bad for them for that. Um, but his comment was to the media, quote, these are really good guys that just made a bad choice. And he gave them a one game suspension from the season opener. And so I read this in the paper and I was hurt. I was devastated. I just, I didn't understand. And I immediately equated the worth of my life to a one game suspension. I thought that's what my worth was as a human and, and what, value was placed on what happened to me and I also didn't understand you know good guys bad choice like this is a gang right this is not like you were speeding and you got a, a ticket so um again I'm Jane Doe there's nothing I can do about it and I remember at the time you know my mom used to always tell me when I was growing up that time heals all wounds and I'm sure many of you have heard that and I thought, okay, well, time will heal this wound. It'll take a long time, but I'll be fine. I'll go to school, I'll take care of my kids. It'll be fine. And so that's what I did. I, and I started living a double life like many of us do. Um, on the public facing side, I went to nursing school. I got, um, I have a, a registered nurse license. I have a bachelor's. I have a master's in business and healthcare management. I started running a team. Um, in dialysis, like I was very accomplished in, in my, in my work. Um, and, you know, in the public, it looked good. I, I bought a house. I made a lot of money. I took care of my kids. Um, you know, I'd beat the odds kind of, so to speak. Um, and, you know, on the other side of my life, though, my, my, my personal side, I was really struggling. I just, I was, suicidal. I um, had, you know, depression. I have a disordered eating thing that I still deal with today. PTSD. If I was in any type of a relationship, it was, it was violent in some way. Either it was abusive in, you know, physically or mentally or emotionally. Um, and, you know, my kids were living a double life with me too. I think that's also the sad part of all of this is that I don't know that people really think about, it's not just my trauma, but it's what happens to our families. It's the generational aspect of it too. Um, you know, my sons were living a double life out in public. We looked great, but at home we were not okay. And to say that my sons didn't suffer, uh, would be an understatement, right? Like I did, I know in my heart that I did the best that I could. But the reality is that, you know, over those 16 years before I came forward with my story, and my boys were little, they were raised by a suicidal, depressed mother. And uh, that means I wasn't able to give them my best, right? And so, um, you know, people ask me today if, if I hate the men that did this to me. And I can say that um, I, I don't hate them for what they did to me in that apartment. But I hold this... Um, anger that I, I, I try to really work on really hard, but you know, they stole those years from me and my family. Mm -hmm. And I wish that we would, as a society, talk more about the generational trauma that happens and is, you know, carried on. If not, if we don't intervene and we don't take care of it, then it, it gets passed on. And I wonder sometimes about if we even know like where it started, you know, if I had never come forward and my sons had never known what happened to me and then I raised them a certain way and they're dealing with something and then they pass it on their children and it morphs into something else and something else, you know? So um, anyways, uh, so that was kind of what was going on during those 16 years. And then in uh, 2014, I turned 40 and I don't know if everybody does this when they turn 40, but I kind of was looked in the mirror and I was like, is this what you're life is just like live this double life because you know this is gonna suck because you're gonna live for like you know probably till you're 100. So um, I decided to go to counseling. I wasn't a huge proponent of it but I was, was really desperate and wanted something different in my life. I kind of you know by then kind of raised my sons, did well in my career and you know at some point you're just left with yourself. Yeah. Right? And you don't have other projects. So um, 
I decided to go to counseling and it, it was good. It took me a while to start talking about what happened to me, but um, I did. And then through this really crazy series of events, I ended up meeting a reporter and I told him my story. And he said, um, you know, I think that you, I think you could help someone with your story. If you wanted to share it, I would like to write it. And I said, um, you know, what story? I don't, I don't understand. Like, what, what do you mean? Like, I don't, I don't understand why anybody would care. Um, this was before Me Too and some of the athletic scandals we've seen in the media. This is 2014. And so I said, you know, I don't think anybody would care. And he's like, no, I think pe not only would people care, but I think you could help someone. And I was like, well, okay, fine. Put my name and my face on it. And a lot of people think I did that as an intentional act of courage. Um, and I didn't. That was not, to me, in my mind, that was not courage. That was me being desperate for something different in my life. And I just thought maybe if I share this story, maybe when it runs with my name and my face on it, maybe the next day I'll wake up and not want to die. Um, and, you know, my battle with suicidal ideation um, was hard, but I, I knew I couldn't die because I had to take care of my kids. But at the same time, I didn't want to be here. And so that's a really just torturous existence to live. Um, so the story ran, 2014, November 2014, it ran, and I was, I was terrified. Um, but, the, you know, the blessing was this time people believed me. Um, not only did they believe me, but they reached out to me. They thanked me for sharing my story. Uh, the president of Oregon State, not the president then, but the one now, he apologized to me and through the media, which to my knowledge at the time, he was the first president in the history of college, the history of college, to issue a public apology to a survivor through, like, in that way. And so that happened. Um, the coach who back in 1998 made that comment about me, he was actually there in 2014 when the story came out. And he apologized through, to me through the media. Um, invited me to go to Oregon State to meet him. And then a lot of people had questions about my story, like what really happened back then? And so the school did an investigation and my reporter did an investigation. And thankfully for me, everyone talked. Um, and so what happened was a month later in December 2014, I got the results of the investigation. And what happened was back in 1998, um, our football stadium at Oregon State was called Parker Stadium. And the school was actively um, fundraising to renovate the football stadium. And uh, rape scandals are not usually good for fundraising. And so th my story needed to go away. And so back then, the, the police, the DA, the university president used to get together and have conversations about how to take care of athletics. And um, there had to have been a conversation about me. But the first thing that happened was the DA misled me. The DA said I didn't have a good case. It was he said, she said. But the DA had taped confessions from all four men all four men admitted to varying different crimes against me, all of them, um, including rape, sodomy, everything. And then, um, so that happened. And then the police did not test my rape kit and they threw it in the trash three years before the statute of limitations was up to prosecute those men. The statute of limitations at the time was six years. And then the uh, university president told everybody at the school, don't talk about Brenda. And nobody did everybody knew what happened to me and nobody did anything. And it worked um, because obviously I went away. I didn't cooperate with the, with the prosecution. Um, I disappeared from view. And then um, the Reeser family donated $5 million to the school. And one year later, Parker Stadium was renovated to Reeser Stadium. And that's the stadium that is there today. And um, I still struggle with that. The, you know, I got, I got those results of that investigation um, and I didn't really know what to do with that. I didn't know what that meant about me and humanity, really. Um, so I, and then I got mad. And so I, I went and I tried to find a lawyer and I said, you know, what can I do and who can I sue? This can't be okay. And what I was told by the, my lawyer was that there was, no, there was nothing I could do. Um, these statute of limitations had ran even if those men confess, there's nothing I could do. Um, their DAs have immunity. They get to pick and choose their cases. They didn't have to take mine. Um, and there were no laws about rape kits. So the police didn't do anything wrong either. And I wasn't a, a student out at Oregon State. So um, Cleary, Title IX, none of that stuff protected me because I wasn't a student. So I was literally pushed through every single crack 
that could happen. You know, people say that I fell through the crack. I'm like, no, I didn't fall through any crack. I was pushed <laughs> through some cracks. Um, so what my lawyer did say in that moment, though, that day, and I remember very clearly, was she said, we can't do anything about your case, but we could help you change some laws if you wanted to do that. And I said, yes. And so two months later, I walked into my Capitol and uh, I found a legislator who was friendly to the issue and had read my story. And I immediately got to work on changing the statute of limitations to prosecute rape. Um, and then we did some, that first session we did also like, we have private advocates on our, on our campuses, not just confidential, but private. So we have a, a law about that. Um, and then we also have a law where if you are a survivor of sexual assault on a campus, if you, you are supposed to be given a piece of paper in plain English that explains exactly what your rights are on campus, off campus. Because I think one of the things for me I realize is that a lot of times you don't even know your rights have been trampled on until after the fact, until after it's too late to even do anything about it. And so um, those are the first three laws I helped pass in the first session. And then we worked on um, a rape kit bill. So like you have to keep our rape kits for 60 years in Oregon. Um, you can't throw them in the trash anymore. <laughs> um, and then also um, you have to test every single kit. And also our statute of limitations, if there's any type of new evidence that comes, um, you can reopen a case. So basically we don't have a statute of limitations in Oregon anymore. Um, and then I've, I've worked on like civil shield laws and I'm, there's some other stuff I'm doing this year, but being a citizen lobbyist is super important to me. And I think that um, anybody can do it, right? Like if you just identify an issue and you find a friendly legislator who will help you to get the law written, like you can do that. And I didn't know anything about what I was doing. I just asked, where do I go? Who do I talk to? And that's what I did. I did what people told me kind of to do and I figured it out as I went because um, I didn't know what to do. So that's a really important part of my life. And then the other thing I do is I speak. I told you that I work a lot with men. That started because I, uh, so Coach Riley is the coach who said those things about me. He left in 2000, 15, he left Oregon State, and he had invited me to come meet him, and I, I didn't go. I wasn't interested in talking to him at that point, but then he went to Nebraska to um, coach football there, and he reached out to me again while he was there and asked if I wanted to meet him and maybe talk to his team, and so the summer of 2016, I, that took all, that was intentional courage. I mustered up the courage to get on a plane, and uh, <clears throat> I went and I met Coach Riley, and I sat down with him in his office for about an hour and a half. And basically told him how much I had hated him for 16 years and all of the things he said about me. I think that, you know, what those men did to me was really bad. But I think that I can rationalize a bad person and I can kind of rationalize a rapist or a sociopath. But at the time, I just kind of had this assumption that all coaches were like good men of good character, building good men of good character. And I didn't understand how this good person could, you know, minimize me to nothing. And so, you know, I, I shared this with him and uh, he was really amazing in that moment. He didn't, um, not only did he apologize, but it was, it was, and it wasn't even really about the sorry part. It was about him holding himself accountable to me. It was about his body language. It was about the things that he didn't defend. It was about like, I'm sorry, period. Not I'm sorry, but here's why you shouldn't be upset with me. I was a young coach or whatever. Um, it was just, I'm sorry that I was the person that caused that pain for you. And, 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 and just was that. And that really, um, that from him, I was going, I was making peace no matter what he did or didn't do, because that, that's within my power. Um, but he definitely made it easier for me. And then uh, I went into his team room and I talked to 120 football players and I told them what happened to me that night. And their co and the coach, like Coach Riley stood right there in front of them and held himself accountable to the room also. And uh, that was the scariest thing I probably, uh, one of the scariest things I've ever done is stand in front of 120 young men and tell them what, ha what happened to me that night. Um, but it was also very empowering. Um, and then that story went viral in the media. And then uh, schools just started calling. Uh, Baylor was the next one to call and then Oklahoma. And then at first I was like, okay, well, I'll just keep going. You know, if they keep calling, they'll stop. But the, you know, if they keep calling, I'll keep going. And I just kept going and I kept going and I kept going and I'm like six years out and I'm still going. Um, but uh, I will say that, you know, 
in my bio, you heard about the set the expectation campaign. So here's the thing. Um, when I started working with football teams and with men, I, I knew immediately um, when I, when I made the decision to be an activist, right? Cause at some point you have to make the decision, am I going to do this work? Right. Or am I just going to be a newspaper article in the, in the Oregonian? This is what happened to me. Or am I going to do something with it? And when I made the decision to do something, I was like, okay, well, what do I do? I didn't, I didn't really know. I was like, how do you be an activist? Like, is there like an activism for dummies? Like, I didn't really know what to do. And so one of the things I thought, which is really kind of funny, I was like, well, am I supposed to start a nonprofit? That's what you do, right? Like, <laughs> you start a nonprofit. And so I didn't really want to start a nonprofit. So I just started Googling, like what people were doing. And I found a lot of great nonprofits and work being done by uh, people that don't identify as men. Uh, like everybody else, like everybody that identifies as a woman or LGBTQ or whatever gender identity or whatever, that's not just like male, male, male was like doing a lot of work. And I was like, well, what are the, the men doing? And so I started Googling that and there wasn't as much. And so I was like, well, for me, it was really simple, right? Like if, if the groups were disproportionately affected by this violence could stop it, they would have already done it. Right? Like, there's all these agencies and people doing work. If we could stop it alone we, ourselves, we would do it. And I knew that the vast majority of sexual violence is committed by men. So I didn't understand why there wasn't more engagement from the male identifying population to stop this activity, these activities and crimes. Um, so immediately I knew I wanted to talk to men. Um, and then obviously sports is a, is a pretty, you know, it, it, goes with my story. And then also, I think we all kind of know the power of sports at this point in our, in our country. We've, we've seen a lot of stuff that's going on with social justice through sports. And so I thought, well, that's what I want to do. <clears throat> and so I had the opportunity to do it. And so I started going into these rooms and I started talking to these men, super hyper masculine spaces, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but I go into these rooms and I share my story and I let them know that like, you know, I'm, I'm a woman and if I could do this work by myself and end this, I would do it by myself. Um, but I'm not the person. It, so here's so here's what I tell them. I tell them that you know men, this is your issue. This is a men's issue, and it's about ten percent of our male population committing these crimes. So about ninety percent of our men, we can say, are good. But a lot of men in this space are either complicit in their silence, or they're complicit in their inaction, or they think I'm a good guy. Why does this affect me? Right. And, and it, but it's men that are committing these crimes against other men, women, children, LGBTQ populations. I mean, everybody. So I didn't understand why men were not more involved. And so that's what I do. I go into these rooms. I talk to men. I ask them, you know, which, which, which side are you? Are you, are you the 90 percent? Are you the 10 percent? And who are you going to be in this world? Are you here to help? Or are you here, here to harm? Um, just not committing violence is not enough. What are you doing to prevent it? How are you showing up in the world? What about your words? What about your actions? What about what you're not saying? What about, um, you know, are you being silent on things? When your guy friends in the locker room are talking about this hoe and slut and bitch and whatever, and she deserved it or whatever, are you just silent? So then they think that you agree with them? You know, what, what, is, what are you doing? Where, what is your place on this issue? And it's very interesting in these rooms to see the young men who really do get it like they understand i mean i say to them all the time like do we expect children to end child abuse why do we expect it to be on um, people of color to end racism why is it that we always for some reason decide that the group most affected is the group that's supposed to end the violence against themselves that makes sense and i just never understood that concept and so i work uh with a lot of men everywhere I go and I talk to them as though they are the solution because I know that they are. And I, I believe that wholeheartedly. The Set the Expectation campaign is um, a campaign that we do a lot of stuff. We raise awareness. So we use sports to raise awareness. Um, we have, I have the Tracy rule. Uh, rape is not an NCAA violation. You can commit rape, be convicted in a court of law and still play sports and get scholarships. Um, but you can't, you know, accept $5. <laughs> um, so I work a lot on that. Um, there's a set the expectation pledge. I ask coaches to set the expectation about behavior with their players. A lot of coaches are recruiting violent athletes. They're keeping them on their teams. 
um, there's just not a lot of involvement. I think all, in general, a lot of men are like, it's not my problem. It's not my issue. And what I do is make them understand that, yes, this is your issue. And that this is an issue of humanity. And anyone, anyone can be the victim of sexual violence. It doesn't matter. If you're a human, you could be the victim of sexual violence. The, sexual violence does not discriminate. So that's a lot of the work I do. Um, I also work with um, survivors. I would say probably the main thing I talk to survivors about is just that it's not your fault. I try to help them just navigate this trauma where we've just decided that it's our fault and we've decided that we've done something and we've taken on all the victim blaming and we're you know blaming ourselves and mostly just spend a lot of time on that. I don't, I don't, I think so often um, for, for certain communities and, and marginalized communities, we're just always told like how to protect ourselves and how to keep ourselves safe. And it's ingrained in us. And that's just, that's not where it's at. We need to start talking to men about holding each other accountable um, and not committing the, these atrocities. Because really at the end of the day, I can't force anyone to make the decision to use their body to violate mine. That's not a thing. Mm -hmm. It's not a thing. And so it doesn't matter it, what I was wearing. It doesn't matter if I drank. That person still made that decision to do that to me. And so I refuse to take any responsibility for anything that happened that night. I, I don't care what it is. It's mm -hmm. absolutely not my fault. And, and, and even if, and I say this to coaches and, and fathers all the time, even if your daughter didn't do what you said, or even if she knew that, you know, or, or he or, or doesn't matter. Even if you know something bad happened the night before at this party and you decide to go to that party too, does that mean that the consequence should be rape or sexual violence? No, there's nothing that anybody does that that should be the consequence or that should be the outcome. And so that's a lot of the work that I do. Um, and it's hard. I'm not going to lie. It's hard. It can be hard to work with men. Um, I think sometimes I feel like I'm in calculus and they're in like mass 60 <laughs> when we talk about these issues. So, but I, I do my best to just, you know, when people say like, I want to do better, I want to help, then I'm happy to meet people where they're at. Cause I think that's the most important thing is I don't expect people to know everything, I, but I want you to have a desire to want to do better and have a desire to do some of that work on your own too. I'm not going to do everything for you because that's not my job. I don't want the onus to always be on the survivor to have to do the work. Um, but I am willing to meet people where they're at. So I think, and I think that's been an important part of my work too, is that um, just having that openness that it's okay if you don't know everything, but you want to know more and you want to do better. So let's work together and let's all sit at the, at the same table to make sure we fix this. So I think that's kind of a decent synopsis of me. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow, Brenda. Um, thank you, first of all, for sharing your story. Um, thank you for, um, for the work that you do today um, as, we, as we pursue this journey of, of healing and ending sexual violence. Um, your voice is powerful. Your passion is clear. And, Thank and you. It ignites all of us. Um, I think every every I think everybody uh, I think I think I speak for everybody when I say that we are encouraged and we are um, continue to be inspired by people like you. So thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I have a few questions, but um, yeah, let's I, do it. I, I, Q and A is my favorite part. I love Q and A. Yeah, right. But I, I definitely want to open it up to to our audience questions as well. So if if anyone has questions. Um, and you want us to ask on your behalf, you can put them in the chat. If you want to ask directly, just raise your hand and we will, we will organize that. Um, Miranda will let me know if there are questions in the chat because I'm, I'm not the best uh, at, at doing both, at speaking and looking in chats. But I'll just ask, um, and I, I, you spoke a little bit about this, but how is the work that you're doing now, how has it impacted your personal journey as a survivor? So I'm going to be super candid and honest about this. Um, it's so when I go in a room, when, when I have prior to COVID, when I was in rooms working with people and I haven't shared my story a lot over zoom. Um, but when I'm in specifically also when I'm in a room with, with men, like 
we'll say the setting is a, is a team room of a football team. Um, I share my story in really graphic detail. Like I go into like what happened to me that night in pretty graphic, horrible detail. And I revisit my trauma and it's, it's hard for me. I do a lot of like, um, kind of grounding myself, looking at my feet, like you're, you're here. I, I take deep breaths, but, um, I, I cry and I talk about how, you know, I can't revisit that trauma and connect to it without crying, without feeling shame, without, you know, feeling all these things. But then at the same time, you know, I also do live a good life and I take care of myself and everything. Um, but, you know, I, I did that. So I share my story in that graphic detail. And then I talk about, you know, why this is, you know, their issue specifically. And, and a lot of light bulbs go off in the room. And then the question is always, what can I do? And I, and I tell them ways that they can get involved. And I've done this probably, I don't know, over a hundred times. And I will say that I don't recommend it for other survivors. I, I do think that one, working with men has its own, uh, you know, unique challenges. Um, so I'm not always in a room full of people who love me and understand things or, or want me there. Um, so that dynamic alone can be difficult. But then also revisiting your trauma can be really hard. If you're not very, very, very active in self-care, like hardcore self-care, it, it can be really, really hard. And I have kind of, during COVID, when I finally like took a break and you know had to take a break, I kind of realized like how much it, it started to wear on me. Like... Mm -hmm emotionally I, I think I just kind of felt like it was kind of starting to erode me that I was like living so close to my trauma all the time mm -hmm. and so having this break with COVID has been really really good for me I've been in therapy and um doing like some EMDR stuff and and even for like trauma that's happened to me since I've been doing this work because I'll tell you that um you know I have a lot of people that don't like me um I'm a pretty prominent voice in sports and so um, SI just named me like one of the most top 25 powerful, most influential women in sports. And I'm not even an athlete. So that's like a really big deal. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't say that to brag, but I say that because um, I've worked really hard and I, and I do have a lot of influence in the space. But then with, you know, every movement comes a counter movement, right? And with every person that loves you, there's probably somebody that doesn't like you. And so, you know, I received a death threat um, here to my home. It was a, it was, um, a letter that was full of white powder that it said it was anthrax and it ended up not being, but there's a, you know, ongoing FBI investigation. Um, so I deal with death threats. I deal with a lot of bullying. I do, I deal with people, you know, that have private investigators digging into me. Um, there's been Reddit posts that have been taken down that were planning my rape. Um, so there's backlash, right? And there's stuff that I have to deal with uh, doing this work and speaking out for um, other people. Um, so it, it comes at a, a at, it does come at a cost. I, I, I won't say that it doesn't. I'm not gonna say it's all rainbows and unicorns, um, but I take really good care of myself. I'm really, really intentional about what I do. I do not what recommend do do? Yeah. How, How do, do I do, do that? Oh, well, first off, you gotta get straight on what is self-care, right? Because I think in, in, in regular society, I think sometimes we think self-care is getting your nails done, it's getting your hair done, it's going on vacation, but how many of us go on vacation and we're tired? Like, you got to come home and you got to unpack and, you know, like, you you didn't really relax. 